Sam is going to be speaking about Okpo. Did I get that? The town yes, you did. The town of Okpo in okay. South Korea. Wonderful. Um, in addition to the shipbuilding industry, Adam will also talk about um, beautiful Korean island, including its food, holidays. I've already seen some of the pictures, and they're amazing. Um, so, Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you so much for tonight. Excellent. Appreciate thank you that. for having me. And thank you all for coming. So I'll talk tonight uh, about shipbuilding in South Korea. I was lucky enough to be captain of three uh, new build, dynamically positioned drill ships that were built in South Korea. Uh, so we'll talk about the, uh, the shipbuilding, the amazing shipyards there. We'll talk a little bit about offshore drilling, and then we'll talk a lot about uh, Korea. So um, this was my second ship that I was captain of in the dry dock a little bit before she was launched. That's me down there. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a common theme with pretty much all the pictures of the shipyard and the ships is just the scale. It's really hard to appreciate the scale of a lot of this stuff. Uh, these are, uh, that one was 820 feet long, which actually isn't super huge for a ship, but it's a very complex ship with a lot of systems on it. Uh, they cost about $600 million each. And there was quite a boom building these ships. Well, the whole dynamic positioning thing for offshore took off in the late 90s. Um, and then there was a boom of constructing ships around 2010 through two, 2013. Um, sadly, it's uh, somewhat historical. We're here in a maritime museum devoted in part to maritime history. And in a sense, this is a bit uh, relegated to history now because ships like this haven't really been built in any significant numbers for about 10 years. And there's still a number of these ships, brand new, built like 10 years ago, sitting in their shipyards uh, unused. No run No, there's, they have uh, azimuthing thrusters that weren't put on yet. So our role there, my role as captain and, and a lot of the other crew members too, we were there to help the project team uh, to see that the ships were built correctly. And also we were there to learn the ships before we took them over at delivery. Um, as again, they were quite complex. We really had to be, I was there two years in advance for this project, uh, the previous ship uh, there for a year. Many crew members would be there six months or more, just learning the systems, getting up to speed on the ship. Um, so it was a fascinating opportunity. So the Korean shipyards are just insane. Uh, they're just incredibly well organized. They're big, they build crazy number of ships a year. These pictures are taken at uh, DSME, Daewoo Shipbuilding, Marine Engineering. That goes back and forth between the second or third uh, biggest shipyard in Korea. They build about 30 ships a year, and these are all essentially state-of-the-art big, you know, the biggest container ships, state-of-the-art drill ships. Uh, they built, at this time, they built the biggest ship in the world, period, which I'll show you pictures of. Uh, so the shipyards are just amazing places. This shipyard has five floating dry docks, two enormous graving docks, or, uh, you know, which are cut into the earth and have a caisson that seals the water out. And then our ship was actually built essentially in a parking lot because they were out of dry docks. So they built it what they call the heavy zone and then pushed it onto a barge, which I'll show you pictures of. Um, so that's a view. This is the town of Okpo, which uh, for a while there was my second home and I still pine for it just about every day. The shipyard is off to the right. I'll show another picture. Uh, and you can see some of the here's semi-submersible drilling rigs that are built as a drill ship. Uh, this is one of their huge crane barges. There's just a whole lot going on there. Uh, here are some of the semi-submersible drilling rigs, drill ship in the background. And there's a view of just part of the shipyard. And you can see there's just a whole lot going on at this place. Uh, so that was one of our ships right there. These are, again, some of the biggest container ships in the world. This is essentially a super tanker, um, car carriers. So just an amazing, uh, amazing place. This is another view. This is actually the next shipyard over. This is Samsung Heavy Industries. It was a very clear day. I was up hiking in the little mountain behind the town and get a nice picture of that shipyard. It's about a 20 minute drive away. So the essentially number two and number three shipyard in Korea are on Goje Island. And then the biggest one, Hyundai Heavy Industries, is in Ulsan. And that's about a two hour drive away. Um, 
Where do they rank in terms of the world? Essentially the first. It's arguable China probably does more by tonnage now, but uh, certainly for like high value complex ships, Korea is right up there. Are they uh, building the VLCCs? Yes. Yeah, that, that was one of them in that last picture. Adam, do you want to tell me you'll take more? I will. I can, I can talk okay. back and forth. So here's uh, another view of the shipyard. Again, the scale of this is hard to appreciate. Um, this structure here is probably about 15 stories tall. There's our ship on the ground coming together. Um, it's just a very uh, incredibly well-organized process. The ships are built in modules all around the shipyard. I had this bright idea that I was going to set up a camera and take a picture of our ship as it was coming together on the ground. I thought this would be cool, do a time-lapse thing. Well, it didn't really work because they build the ship in like 20 different places in the shipyard and then essentially not literally, but more or less, one night it just all comes together and, and there it is. Uh, but the one thing they can't do, one of the things they can't do in advance is wiring. So our ship was, the hull was floating within about six months, six to eight months of cutting the first steel. And then it was a solid year after that, wiring the ship, commissioning the systems, outfitting it. Uh, so that part still takes time. Here's another view of the crazy shipyard couple of the drill ships. This is one half of the biggest ship in the world that they built. And then the Dutch owners realized that the ship wasn't wide enough for the contracts they wanted. It was a semi catamaran. In other words, it's 400 feet wide and then the two bows stick out. And it's designed to go up to uh, self-standing offshore structures, chop off the top side module, grab onto it, they chop it off, the ship holds onto it, it backs up, turns around, puts down this enormous skid, and they pull like a thousand foot structure onto the back of the ship, and then it sails away. It's for decommissioning enormous offshore structures. Anyway, it wasn't wide enough, so they made the call to the yard, cut it in half, and make it wider, which they did. <laughs> uh, that's another view of the rigs being built. There's the shipyard. There's always a collection of barges bringing different components and pieces. I've got many more pictures to come of that. All right, here's that world's biggest ship. Uh, I went up on it and walked from one side to the other just to say I did. <laughs> but um, another view of the yard. Again, just colossal scale. This is about a, where is it? That's like about a 100-foot tugboat there. That's about a 15-story structure there. So you can see how enormous that crane is. Everything is just huge. And there's our ship taking shape in the heavy zone. Yeah, more vessels in construct under construction in the background there. Every day, big modules of ships come in from elsewhere in Korea. Um, and there's the world's biggest ship. It's called the Pioneering Spirit. And there she is, chopped in half. So what they did, they, they built the ship, realized it was too narrow, cut it in half, put, I think, one half in the dry dock, attached the new longitudinal section, then refloated that, joined the two pieces together in the water, and then dry docked the whole thing and finished welding it up. And this is the kind of stuff that goes on there all the time. Uh, that's about a 12-story high accommodation block. This derived, like I say, every day things like that's about a 100,000 horsepower diesel engine. Those would show up all the time. That's the accommodation block of one of our drill ships. Just arrived on a barge. There's another one. So I think, oh, there's a bow, complete bow of a huge <laughs> ship. <laughs> Oh, this place is just nuts. And everything is so uh, modularized, so programmed in advance. They'll literally have a chunk of a ship's engine room with the machine shop, with the lathe sitting on the deck already, already like, and covered over. So this is probably electrical switch gear, whatever. It's just all there, ready to go. And then they'll just add more modules around it. And uh, there we go, stern section of another vessel. This was one of my favorites, so it's just about time to float out our drill ship from the dry dock. And this tugboat 
came up to the dry dock caisson and the shipyard workers are fussing with it. And it's kind of a funny place for a tugboat to be. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, they're not going to do what I think they're going to do. And sure enough, they shackled it onto the crane and they picked up this full-size tugboat and stuck it in the dry dock so it could help push our ship out. Uh, <laughs> more rigs. So again, this is the physical, physical construction of the ships is so organized and so efficient. The dry docks, with one noticeable exception, pretty much have run on schedule to the day for many, many years. It's just programmed. It just happens on time. But then it all slows down once the vessels are floating and the wiring has to happen and the commissioning and troubleshooting and then that, that can slow down and things don't always go perfectly to schedule. So I guess like, there's just like no end of superlatives about this shipyard and what was going on there. Besides the world's biggest ship, besides the state-of-the-art drill ships, the world's biggest container ship, the VLCCs or super tankers, this thing, which is the top sides module of an offshore plant, I think it was the largest uh, hydraulic lift. They use this jacking system. It was the biggest such lift ever done. Uh, it was just kind of record-breaking stuff all the time. And there's our ship. Now they have hydraulically skidded it off the heavy area or parking lot onto this launching barge. There's two about 18-wheeler size hydraulic units and they just pushed it about a foot at a time all night long down this track. And then by the next morning there it was on that barge and they just tow the barge out, sink the barge down, and the ship floats free. And there she is being tied up. And again, now the sort of slow part starts, the wiring and everything else. When the ship's under construction, they put these access openings in the hulls, usually one forward and one aft, and they've got gangways because you've got hundreds of shipyard workers going on and off. It's just a whole lot easier to be able to walk right straight into the hull. So that was always a very sad day for me when they would close those up because then we'd know the ship was probably going to leave in a few months. Now, obviously, I'm there and everyone else is there to get the ship completed, to get it to work. The point of the ship is to drill oil wells, but it's so much fun to be in these shipyards. It's so much fun to be in Korea that we never really wanted to leave. Um, so there's the pilot house of our ship. There's the wiring in progress. Um, and they plug away at that for months. And then that turns into that. And it's a functioning bridge, and it's time to leave. Um, so these ships are dynamically positioned, which means they use their own propellers or thrusters to hold themselves in place. Um, reason for this is that you know oil drilling started, of course, on land. They essentially drilled all the, found all the oil they could find on land, started to go offshore, first on piers that went out from the shore, then barges, then eventually that wasn't satisfactory, so they put rigs on uh, floating barges that could go deeper offshore, and barges that could go out, jack themselves up on legs, and then drill even farther offshore. So there's a steady progression, farther and farther offshore, uh, culminating in semi-submersibles, which are those square-looking rigs you saw, that up until about 20 years ago would be anchored up into maybe 5,000 feet of water. And they'd use sizable supply boats, pull the anchors out from the rig, position them, and it could drill. Well, then as they got into, say, 10,000 feet of water depth, it becomes impractical to anchor. And that's what led to the rise of the dynamic positioning. And that's when you started to need captains on oil rigs, which is how I got involved in the business. And that, of course, is what's going on here. But half of those screens are devoted to the dynamic positioning system, and then the other ones forward are the more conventional uh, radars and ships navigation systems. And then it was time for us to, that was actually sea trials, but that's what we looked like steaming away from Korea. The ships I worked on worked uh, primarily in West Africa in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we made one trip to Egypt, one trip to Pakistan, uh, and then also drilled in Israel. So I got to move around a fair bit. Another, of course, hot spot for drilling is uh, off Brazil. 
and then there's the North Sea, but the drill ships don't really work in the North Sea so well. Um, and then we go to work. So this ship went to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and we set about drilling. Everything that the ship needs is brought to it by supply vessels. I mean, this is about a 250-foot supply vessel. It's basically a ship in its own right. And we would take about two such vessels working full time to bring the ship what it needed. And then the people and other, uh, a few other supplies come by helicopter. So we'd uh, crew change by helicopter. So there's just a whole big support operation to keep these ships running. And they're designed to not have to go to a dry dock for about 20 years. So it's kind of a fascinating process. When the ship gets commissioned in Korea, they bring in the crew, they start to fire up the equipment, and you know it's almost like a living thing. It starts running months before it's delivered. The crew is in place, it's, and the shipyard is there. Eventually it's handed over completely to the crew, but the ship has been running partially for months before it even leaves the yard, and then it just runs offshore night and day continuously for, if all goes well, for decades. Now, there's been an interruption to that with the downturn in the oil field, and they've had to lay up or stack, as they call it, drill ships, which is kind of unprecedented because they've never, up until recently, turned one of these things off, basically, and then powered it up again. Um, and they're doing that now as the activity picks up, and I think the estimates, I'm going to say, between like 50 and $100 million just to reactivate one of these ships because they're so complicated. Um, So the oil field, particularly in these bigger rigs, is kind of a fascinating mix of like big iron and uh, high technology. Uh, a lot of the scenes are just what you'd expect in the oil field, but there's just a whole lot of technology going on uh, behind it and around it. Um, that's looking up into the derrick. This is what's called a dual activity vessel. So it essentially has two complete drilling packages. These things are called top drives. So these go up and down in the derrick, and they're what rotate the drill string. They're essentially the biggest cordless variable speed drills you could imagine, except they're not cordless. Uh, that's literally they're just variable speed rotating devices. Um, and then the drill string is racked back in the derrick, and then there's a whole automated pipe handling system. And again, this is about 200 feet tall that moves around, grabs a stand of drill pipe, rotates, puts it over the well center, and lowers it down. So it's a pretty fascinating operation. And then, of course, there's a whole cargo operation going on. So this is a view from inside one of the cranes. Now, these are knuckle boom cranes, which are very cool. They're totally hydraulic, articulated cranes, uh, perfect for offshore. There's the decks. And you can see there's just a whole lot of supplies. It's constantly coming and going and being used. Um, typical nice day offshore. Of course, the drilling is controlled with something called the cyber chair. So uh, <laughs> everything's somewhat computerized. This is what's called the uh, KT ring. This is the top of the riser. This is what goes down into the ocean about two miles down to the blowout preventer, or BOP. So this is the underside of the drill floor. And then this telescopic joint allows the ship to heave up and down in the waves without damaging the riser. Now, this is another drill floor view. There's a couple of the supply boats that took care of us. We get all kinds of interesting support vessels around us. Uh, this was a, a, a pipe laying vessel. And there she is at night. And there's a view from the bridge looking out. This is the dynamic positioning screen. You can see the little image of the ship. So this system kept the ship uh, about in an area about this big, about one meter, let's say, on average, is a typical footprint. Uh, pretty much regardless of weather conditions or current, the system would just constantly adapt and hold the ship on location. Uh, And there's some offshore scenes. And this is our ship doing something called an extended well test. So a big thing on the drill ships, or most of the rigs, is that 
you drill for the oil, but the whole name of the game is to keep it down there, uh, particularly the kind of drilling that I was involved with, which was exploratory drilling. It's all about seeing what's there, and then they call it plug, it's called plugging and abandoning, capping off the well and leaving it. And the whole idea is for the oil to not come to the surface. That's actually a very bad thing unless it's totally controlled. So this, as sketchy as it may look, was a <laughs> super carefully planned operation, probably planned for years, probably about three months of actual work on the ship just setting up for it. And then we actually brought the oil and gas to the surface and flared it off. And the point of that was to see how quickly it would flow um, and get an idea of how the well would produce. So anyway, that's one of the two best pictures ever of our ship. So let's get back to Korea. Um, of course, here's South Korea. There's North Korea. Won't get into politics, but if you want a lesson in the importance of government, there's probably no better example than South Korea, which is a glorious country, and North Korea, which is hideous. And it's the same land, and the same people, and the same culture, and it's just good government and bad government. And where's Okpo on that map? So Okpo is right down here. This is Busan, kind of the second city of Korea. Seoul is up here. Busan down here. And Okpo is this island just uh, southwest of Busan. And then Ulsan, is the other big shipyard, is right there. And a little more detailed, this is my beloved Goje Island. And Akpo is right here. So you've got Samsung and DSME right there. Those are the two huge shipyards. Um, used to be a four-hour drive all the way around to um, almost four hours just to Busan, well, several hours. But then they built this really cool bridge, which I'll show you about 15 years ago. And now it's like a 45-minute drive. Um, this is probably the prettiest, well, the whole southern part of Korea is probably the prettiest. It just has more dramatic uh, coastline. It's got mountains and bays. It's like Maine, but times a 1,000. Um, so it's just a particularly beautiful area. Um, and this is just to illustrate what rough duty it was in Korea for, <laughs> for the, few, the few years that I was there. <laughs> Uh, so much so that I would come back. Lori and I made several trips back after I worked there, and I want to go back again. Um, so it's a funny thing in Korea. <laughs> it's very black or white. You're either Korean or you're a foreigner. There's no, I mean, it's, it's very simple. You're a Korean or you're a foreigner. Uh, they make no bones about it, but they are very welcoming and friendly to foreigners. So uh, there we go. She specializes in foreigners' hair. <laughs> now, the food in Korea is spectacular. Um, this was a, this was like a lunch after a ship check, essentially. We had to go, we had to go to a factory and like check on something that was being made for the ship. So this is a working lunch after having gone to an industrial facility somewhere. So that's one of the project engineers, a couple of the shipyard reps, and there we go. That's just working lunch. Um, cool thing about Korea is that it's very heavily urbanized. So you've got the big cities, and then even this, like the shipyard, even Akpo, is very dense, very urbanized. It's like a little chunk of Seoul. Like if you're in Hull, it doesn't look remotely like Boston or New York. If you're in Akpo, it looks like a little tiny chunk of Seoul, even though the buildings are small or whatever. It's it's kind of consistently urbanized. The nice thing about that, of course, is the whole rest of the country is rural and unspoiled. So there's just so many, as you'll see, the like villages and hills that are just right by. Most of these pictures are taken very close to the shipyard. This is 15 minutes from the shipyard. Uh, oh, we're back to Korean eating and drinking culture that we'll get into more. Uh, <laughs> this is another, this is lunch during work. Those are the secretaries who weren't crazy about having their pictures taken, but anyway. Uh, more eating. A big thing in Korea are the side dishes. And the restaurant is measured, the quality of a restaurant is measured in part on the quality of the side dishes. They're a big deal. Uh, very often features a grill in the middle of the table. 
best ones have real charcoal, but they also use gas. Uh, and again, the all important side dishes. Simple, this was simple lunch. This was one of our trips back there with a next door neighbor and his sister in 2015. Just a whole funky and wonderful eating and drinking culture. And then one of my favorite things there in the little town of Akpo there were all these fish restaurants on the waterfront. And uh, it was just one of the most fun things was to have go down to the waterfront for your barbecued fish and uh, just basically sitting right by the docks, stepping over fishing nets and having dinners like this. Here's a good grill with charcoal. That's barbecued pork. This is called the Huan Pun Gi. This is the vent which sucks the smoke up from the grill. This was a great place called Noxen Drum Tong, gravel floor, right in Akpo. One thing you'll notice is everyone's wearing their DSME jackets, which even I still have my DSME jacket here. My Korean friend, friends laugh whenever they see a picture of me still wearing my shipyard jacket. But the whole town would be people in these gray suits. I mean, even the women, they just didn't care. Everyone lived there and worked at the yard and just went around in your, in your shipyard gear. This is a very good friend of, of ours, Kyung Im, and her husband. She ran my single favorite restaurant um, for years. So you'll see her picture quite a few times here. Uh, this, of course, is soju in a little glass. Uh, the big drinks in Korea are soju, mekju, which is beer, and makali, which is a white liquor. It looks like milk and uh, tastes kind of like white wine. Um, or you can mix the soju <laughs> and the mekju. <laughs> and then you have somek, and that's great fun. There you go. And there's Lori in Seoul. Another nice dinner. This is one of the many, many little places right in Akpo. Little makali, funky restaurant. Like these little lofts that you could climb up a ladder and sit like below the ceiling. Uh, it's just, you'd never see this in America, but it was awesome. And this is chicken feet which is one of the many fine things you could eat. Uh, this is a team building dinner, the shipyard project crew. This is a pretty routine thing. Sometimes they get pretty immense there. So that's a team building dinner. These were just huge fun. Sometimes the Huan Pun Gi didn't work that well and smoke <laughs> would build up. It was still fun. There you can see, it's the brown bottles for the mekju, green bottles for the soju. A lot of these things were organized by our secretary, Charmaine, who was just a character and a half. Uh, so this is pajon, which is a scallion pancake, uh, which is a great Korean dish. And there's some more pajon. Oh, and here's some of the makali, the white stuff in the, served in a little cup, and there's the bottle of it. There's the chicken feet, which probably the second best, well, it's a few good things I had. The pinnacle of my Korean eating was stink fish, which is rotten fermented skate. Uh, and that was, a, that was a challenge, but it was worth it. Uh, it's a big thing in Korea, your picture is getting taken to do the peace sign for whatever reason. And this friend had no use for that, so she's giving him the side eye over that. Uh, <laughs> We had our own very, there they are. We had our own variation on it. We did the chicken feet thing. So that became a thing for a while. <laughs> and these are bundegi, which is silkworm larva, uh, roasted silkworm larva. And uh, another thing you have to eat. This was actually like a popular snack for school children coming back after school, they'd get their little paper cup of bundegi and it'd be like warm and kind of smell nice. And that was like 
people like our age, a little bit younger, that was like the thing they remember. Uh, and of course, that's probably faded away now. But, uh, and there's our friend Dana trying her bundegi. And there's the little paper cup. All right, more good Korean food in the side dishes. It's just all these funky little out of the way restaurants. Um, all right, now we're in some Korean countryside pictures. I'll run through these pretty quickly. These were taken by one of my colleagues at the, in the shipyard who was a really good photographer. Um, so most of the pictures are my own, but these are his. This is a pebble beach. There's sand beaches and pebble beaches. There's many, many very pretty temples. You can see the gorgeous coastline and all the islands. Um, just a super pretty place. Street food is big in Korea. And hiking is a huge thing. So again, with the tight urbanization and then all the countryside surrounding towns, all that countryside is fair game. It's, it's, I don't know what the ownership structure is or it belongs to the government, but it's just riddled with paths and it's just a Korean national pastime of, of hiking in the hills around the towns. Uh, Still a fair bit of rice cultivation. This is Hagem Gong, which is a pretty, uh, very pretty kind of fishing village right on Goje Island. And this is Wedo, which is the only privately owned island or one of the first privately owned islands in Korea. And it's been turned into a botanical garden. And it's super pretty. Um, This is all like one or two towns away from the shipyard. And then there's Busan, which has, this is about 15 years ago. And uh, they've got as modern apartments as you'll see anywhere. Uh, one of the things that I love so much about Korea is it's this really funky mix. I know this sounds cliche, but it's just this funky mix of old and new, super modern and prosperous, and I'm not gonna have to say poor, but just very, very rustic. Um, I just love how it's mixed together. Yep, we're back to Soju. <laughs> <laughs> and a good night out. And this is a very Korean experience here. This was, again, next door neighbor, his sister. We all went in 2015, had a nice uh, dinner out. And then we stopped at one more place, uh, had these big long tables. So we sat there. And we got this funky soup and our drinks. And then there was this Korean group next to us. And we sat down. We were having kind of fun. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, they're probably going to want to, like, talk to us. Well, sure enough, we all got to talking to them. And it was like 5 AM before the night was <laughs> over. <laughs> and that's just how it is there. <laughs> and it hasn't changed. <laughs> so this is in, like, 1981. One of the engineers I worked with, this is they have a long tradition of building rigs in Korea, and there they all were after work. I love it. There's even, you see the women looking in through the window. <laughs> <laughs> so there's any number of little bars that cater to the foreigners, creatively named. Uh, this is just a whole crazy little town that it's just so much fun, but also Korea is, a, is essentially a very conservative country. So it's also, I don't know, you could get into any kind of trouble you wanted to there if you worked at it, but it's also just easy to have fun. Um, and it's remarkably safe. There's like no crime to speak of. Literally, if you passed out on that street at two in the morning, somebody might push you aside so they could drive by, but your wallet would still be in the mo with you in the morning. It's just, uh, it's just remarkable how um, safe and nice it is. And this is at the height of the drill ship boom, the offshore boom. Again, little bar in the shipyard town, but there were just people from all over the world. Uh, it was a pretty spectacular scene. And you could go to Bourbon Street or someplace like that. It's just kind of, I don't know, forced and this was just fantastic because, again, everyone was there for a reason. It was great fun. 
But nothing was as fun as like the little hole in the wall restaurants. This is a Korean drinking game where you take the soju bottle cap and you twist a little piece and you pass it around and try to break it off with your finger. And of course, the one who breaks it off, the one before him has to drink. Uh, there's more of the gray jackets. That's a little farther on in the soju drinking. This was a very fun night in a, in a uh, descendant of a soju tent, essentially a vinyl, a vinyl tent behind a restaurant, pouring down rain, sitting on a gravel floor with this like hot soup and just a very Korean thing. There's the fish on the waterfront. More soju. So this gets to my thing about the goofiness. Uh, I think you've seen the shipyards. You've seen it's just an industrial like operation, world-class industrial operation on a crazy scale. But this is what their safety posters looked like. It's just laughable uh, and awesome. I think you get the message of that one. <laughs> This is the kitchen of a little restaurant we went to. Uh, here's another restaurant. You just, there's like so many aspects of this picture that I still look at, like, what is that for? Uh, <laughs> so there's the funkiness of Korea. Now I'll ask anybody to guess what that is. That's a highway rest area in South Korea. That is how like advanced this country is, and it's just spectacular. And there's me and Lori. That's the Gwangan Bridge that was built about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it had 7,000 LED lights on it that do like 100,000 different colors every night. It's just, uh, they don't mess around. Uh, signage is spectacular, but there again, there you go. You wouldn't see that in Boston, but I love it. Uh, and this is more of the coastline on Goji Island. This is a building that was put up for a, like an OECD meeting, just a gathering of presidents like 30 years ago, super high tech. Uh, this is a place called Taejung Day. It's rocks near the water in uh, Busan. And of course, Korean style, what would you do with rocks? Well, naturally, you'd put plywood, little plywood platforms there so you can eat and drink on the rocks. This is just a picture of the changing times in Akpo. This is the waterfront where the fish restaurants are, and now about half of them are gone because they're going to put up this big building. So even there, things do change. These are uh, Korean burial mounds. This is a river in Seoul, Chang. It's really cool. They reclaimed about a mile of river right downtown and got the trees and things back. This is actually a view in the shipyard. So again, Akpo was so much fun, so many different nationalities, but it was a very small town at the same time. So you knew people, even though it never got boring because there were so many different people, so many different things going on. This is a sort of typical story. I was there after work one day by myself. There was a parade, a traditional Korean parade going on. All these people dressed up in these Korean costumes, and I'm like, how cool is this? How foreign is this? And it's like, neat to see this. And then this girl runs out, Adam, Adam. Well, this is Gyeong Im's daughter, and said hi to me. So it's just, that's what it's like. This is a turtle ship. This is something the Koreans are very proud of. This was developed in the 1400s, and it's how they fought off the Japanese. It was essentially, you could say, one of the first ironclad. So this is a metal decked, metal covered deck. It's got spikes. This dragon would blow flames, uh, and it was resistant to boarding, and they defeated the Japanese in the Battle of Akpo, right there in Goje Island. So uh, any self-respecting town in that area has a turtle ship, uh, either in the water or on land somewhere. It's just an Akpo street scene. This is uh, Guangali Beach, where that big bridge is. Uh, in the background, you can see this silver building. Most of it's hidden. This is about as outrageous an apartment building as you'll see anywhere. It's this like, curving, all silver uh, building full of million dollar apartments. But then here you see the smaller one. And only in Korea 
they put a big cutout in the side of the building and put some kind of like Death Star radar dishes in the side of it just because it was fun to do. Uh, <laughs> this is Guangali Beach. This is Hagem Gang, the very pretty little kind of fishing village, about 20 minutes, about half an hour from the shipyard. Um, this is just an Akpo scene. This is the Jinju Lantern Festival. This is about an hour from uh, where the shipyard was. Um, this celebrates another Korean victory over Japan when they used floating lanterns to, to signal uh, military stuff. And now it's a whole big party. And there's Lori and Jack, one of our trips. This is Nam He, the next island over from Goje. Um, that's actually my little Hyundai rent a car. It was just so much fun to have that and go exploring. Name is known for its mud flats. Um, that's the new bridge from Busan out to Goje Island. This is one of the biggest bridge tunnel things in the world. Um, again, super elegant and high tech. This is a Wedo, the botanical garden on the island. Super pretty. And that's Akpo about 30 years ago. Uh, they were building oil rigs back then, amazingly enough. And that's the same street about 10 years ago. So things are changing quickly there. But again, this is probably a 10 minute walk from the shipyard. Uh, and you get that little village. That's 15 minutes from the yard. That's my favorite little tea house that's been there forever. Some more hiking. Top of every hill's got a little monument with the name of it and the elevation in meters, so you know what you accomplished with your hiking. That's looking out over Samsung Shipyard. That was us after a day of hiking. And there we are. This was Paul. He had the one sailboat of Akpo, so of course I became friends with him. <laughs> we went sailing a few times. So this is a fascinating thing. I'm sure they still have them, but even about 10 years ago, you'd see signs like this by each beach. And this is cluing you in on North Korean vessels to keep an eye out for and to report them if you see them. Uh, so they're, they're always on guard. And there we are sailing. There's the ship in the shipyard. And that's it. Back to the ship and our extended well test. So. Thank you very much.